Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and we have a return guest today, Mr. Matt Brennan from the University of Glasgow. Matt, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're, we're picking up here. We're doing part two of the history of working drummers, um, which is going off of your book, Kick It, A Social History of the Drum Kit, which uh, was recently released. This is uh, came out in February of 2020, and, and I'm a big fan of it and uh, love it, man. Good, good, good oh. work. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, so in the first part, which I recommend people go back and listen to, but um, I don't think this is a thing where you can't listen to part two without hearing part one. I think this can stand on its own, but I do recommend that people go back. And uh, basically, part one is about the turn of the 20th century up to 1960. And now today we're going to pick it up at 1960 to today. So rock star drummers. All that stuff. We ended with session drummers. So um, why don't you go ahead and uh, and take it away here and and pick up where we left off? Yeah, sure thing, man. Um, so I guess in part one, we got up to the point where we were talking about session drummers like Earl Palmer and Hal Blaine, who it's not as though there weren't session drummers uh, who were working before those two figures, but Blaine and Palmer are very special because they were the among the first drummers to be really, really be recognized as rhythm and blues and rock and roll drummers, and that's what they were being called mm. to perform. So you had a, a, a sort of paradigm shift, I guess, in the kind of skills that were being sought after in, for instance, West Coast uh, session drumming situations where, you know, both... Hal Blaine and Earl Palmer uh, were located in Los Angeles at that time. Folks who will know Earl Palmer know, of course, that he was based for a lot of his career in New Orleans and played on lots of seminal recordings throughout uh, the 1940s and and 1950s. Uh, But in the tail end of the 1950s, rock and roll becomes what many people think at that time is a, a temporary fad and something that's looked upon with with a lot of disdain by other session musicians who are who are working in the Los Angeles area at that time, and Blaine and some of his other buddies, who include um, uh, notable figures like Glenn Campbell, for instance, formed this uh, uh, collective called the Wrecking Crew. The reason for that name is that the other session musicians who were working in the area at that time consistently were, were telling this group that they were going to wreck the business. <laughs> uh, and so they sort of made a name for themselves playing this kind of pariah music, this unacceptable music called rock and roll that was looked down upon that everyone thought would kind of fade away, except it didn't fade away, of course. It became, you know, ever more influential, ever more commercially lucrative. Yeah. And that's why they ended up playing on so many sessions throughout the 1960s. Um, but... Around that time, you also, of course, have another really important shift in Anglo-American musical culture, and that is this shift where previously, in the 1950s and earlier, you would generally have performers, recording artists, who would perform material that was written by someone else. So these were two different kinds of work, the role of a songwriter on the one hand, and then the role of the performer on the other. And when we talk about um, people working in the A&R business, the artist and repertoire business, that is essentially the business of linking those two different spheres of work up together, linking artists with repertoire Hmm. that were created separately and are then put together by the A&R man, Hmm. usually a man, almost always in that year. (laughs) Now, now why, Um, why was like, why did that happen? Why was it less likely that a musician would write their music and go out and perform it? I guess they were seen as two um, different types of skill sets that required different types of experience. And you'll also, of course, have to put that into a context where often, you know, songs were being arranged for large bands, right? Um, So sure. Following on from the big band era, the type of skills that it would take to arrange a, a 20 piece brass section <laughs> yeah. are, are different from those that are, um, you know, needed for carving out a great top line melody or lyric in the 1960s playing in a four piece band. Mm, right. Gotcha, yeah. Um, so they were, 
you know, for historical reasons, seen as sort of separate spheres of work, specialized work, and there wasn't a whole lot of overlap in between. Now, that gets dissolved a little bit when you start thinking of jazz musicians who are composing their own material, but the they they weren't really considered part of the the mainstream of the music industry in that time. They were, you know, still outliers. Uh, and certainly in terms of, you know, putting songs onto the radio and having commercial success of that scale, you know, jazz was was sort of an outlier. That starts to change, of course, with rock and roll music. So, you know, people often talk about rock and roll being this really revolutionary music because it, um, you know, challenged the boundaries between, uh, um, you know, uh, tense race relations in the United States because... It was a, a generational difference where, you know, teenagers were really picking up on this music and their parents uh, hated it. And we could say that it was a transition um, from listening to music more in a live sphere to uh, picking up singles on seven inches, which we have to remember, you know, the seven inch single was only invented in 1948, mm. right? So, the, yeah, <laughs> um, really? you know, rock and roll is kind of one of the, and, and prior to that, rhythm and blues, these are the first genres to really start working around that technological format. Um, but I guess where that takes us is that bands start getting smaller and you start to have artists, you know, as opposed to say Elvis Presley, who actually operates according to that old paradigm, you know, doesn't write his own material, gets paired with repertoire written by other people, right? Um, Chuck Berry, on the other hand, and other pioneering artists of that ilk are writing their own material. Little, Little Richard would be another one. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're working with other people's material. Sometimes they're writing their own material. And this is kind of a transitional phase. But by the time you get to the early 1960s and you start to have bands like The Beatles and, um, and The Rolling Stones, one of the biggest differences that separates them from their predecessors is that they begin writing their own material. And again, you still see that transition happening, um, you know, say on the, the early Beatles and Stones albums where, you know, they're playing a mix of original songs that they've written and then cover versions. Yeah, a of lot songs of covers. That they haven't written. Tons exactly. of covers. So that is absolutely emblematic of that period in history. It's, it's not that they were doing something strange by performing those cover versions. Actually, performing an entire album of covers was the norm. Right, mm. it was inserting their own material that was that marked the change, if that makes sense. No, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this s- starts to create a new perception of what musical work is like in 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 the popular music sphere. So suddenly, musical creativity uh, starts to be more closely tied to you know basically writing and performing your own material. And in the 1950s, you could be a perfectly credible, authentic, quote unquote, act (laughs) uh, without writing your own material. By the time of the Beatles and Stones, that sort of ceases to be the case. If you're not writing your own material, then you'll get tagged as being manufactured or inauthentic Hmm. um, or commercialized, right? Gosh, yeah. It's it's interesting to think about the the differences between those those two different modes of making music. Now, the other key difference from a perspective of work, of course, is that the songwriter has a different revenue stream from mm-hmm. the performer, and this is where it really begins to matter for drummers, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, because in the early 1960s, in guitar-based bands like the Stones and the Beatles, the songwriter was traditionally conceived as being the one who wrote the top line melody and the lyric. And the drummer was not usually involved in that part of creative work. So they are kind of relegated to the bottom of this new musical hierarchy, which is being formed in that time. So, you know, we can think about where the drummer sat in terms of the hierarchy of a, of a bebop group, uh, you know, Drummers like Max Roach, for instance, were you know recognized as as artists, and and of course Max did write some of his own material as well. Um, you know, at, before the Beatles were putting out their albums, Max Roach had already put out the Freedom Now Suite, for instance. Um, mm-hmm. But with 
drummers like Charlie Watts and Ringo Starr, they're not writing those top line melodies and lyrics. And so that actually matters, has, has a lot of consequence, not only just for um, their pocketbooks and, and who's getting remunerated in those bands more than others. It creates an economic hierarchy, but it also creates a, another hierarchy of status in which they're perceived to be um, by, by uh, critics, for instance, who are working at that time as being lesser musicians well, than man. their bandmates. I mean, that goes right back to part one of, as we said in the, the, uh, the musicians union, that drummers should make, they can make two shillings less than the other musicians. And it's just this, yeah. it's all just kind of a connotation of, um, uh, like, I guess you could say the tonal instrument making the top line melody just being the more important thing where uh, it, it is interesting though, because obviously the drummer, we get the benefit of just being able to come in and sit down and make everything better. I'm saying that kind of biased as a drummer, but we can yeah. kind of like, put, <laughs> we can put the icing on the cake and make everything really, really great without, you know, spending six days writing the song. But that's just interesting that it, it continues through this feeling of, you know, you're just, you're the low man on the, on the totem pole. You're just, just yeah. sit down, shut up and play your drums. You know, you don't, you don't get paid as much. Well, what's also interesting, though, is and what people don't often realize with some of these bands is that, say, the Beatles, also the Rolling Stones, also the Who, also the Led Zeppelin, uh, you know, they had to go through several temporary drummers, right, hmm. before settling on a permanent drummer who sort of becomes the final member of this core lineup yeah. that turns that band into the band that we recognize it today. Absolutely. So, like, when you see it from that perspective, actually... The work that the drummer is performing is incredibly important. Yes. If you don't find that right drummer, you don't have a successful band, right? Yeah. Those three, <laughs> and, especially that you just named, are legendary. And you can't imagine the Beatles without Ringo, Zeppelin without Bonham, uh, the Stones without Charlie Watts, um, the Who without Keith Moon. I mean, it is, it's just not right without them. Yeah. And not only that, you know... When people knock Ringo Starr, what they're often forgetting is that, you know, the Beatles had previously had, uh, you know, Pete Best. Also, um, you know, if you're going back to the Quarrymen days, like drummers like Colin Hanton and other Liverpool drummers, the, the Beatles were on this um, trajectory of ascent. And as they started being taken more seriously as a band, they had, you know, they could have picked any drummer that they wanted to, to replace Pete Best, right? Yeah. They chose Ringo because he was the best. He's good. In, yeah. you know, in, in Liverpool at making that kind of beat music. Yeah. And man, if you listen to, um, there's an amazing bootleg recording uh, that's made in Hamburg just after Ringo joined the band. And it is absolutely like, off the wall it sounds like the ramones almost like the <laughs> yeah. you know extremely powerful drumming and you can you know you can see why they were attracted to to ringo and the difference that you know you could hear between um you know previous incarnations of that band and then the beatles with ringo Absolutely. it's a different band yeah right yeah and it's a band that probably wouldn't have had that success without ringo as we're talking about so it's clear that like the drummer is doing something extremely important, but what they're not doing is writing the melody and top line lyric, and therefore they have this weird low status in the hierarchy for, you know, due to sort of arbitrary criteria. And yeah. you sort of can see why those criteria, like, you know, prioritizing top line melody and lyric are arbitrary because they change over the decades. If we think about music made in the 21st century, right? Beat makers are highly prioritized, right? Yes. You know, you sure. you go to a beat maker as much as you go to a top line melodist, right? And yeah. there's remuneration that gets divided up, um, you know, in the songwriting credits that really privileges uh, the beat and how important that is in a contemporary pop song. But that's um, you know a shift in culture, a shift in attitude, a shift in remuneration, and in uh, and in perception of what type of musical work matters that's that's changed between the early 1960s and and now. But yeah. we're sort of getting ahead of ourselves. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do think it's interesting, though, how you, uh, it kind of speaks to the how you can't copyright a drum beat kind of thing. 
how that yeah. puts it all kind of into perspective of we're all, but maybe, maybe there's a part of that that is our amazing drumming community where we all build off of each other and we learn from each other and we, uh, our beats kind of evolve after one guy does something and then the next guy does something. Um, whereas if you do that with guitar and bass or something, it's like, okay, you just stole my guitar <laughs> riff. Whereas, uh, I think, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Where we can just kind of like, like drums are a little more communal where, yeah, you can't copyright it, but we, we just grow together and, and you hear Ringo and you go, oh man, that just changed the style of drumming for the rest of, you know, the rest of time. Albeit it's not solos and Keith Moon style, John Bonham style, but it's, it's got its own very special place of, of, uh, you need to stick out as a drummer with your sound and your technique. And, and that's, I guess how you can, you know, rise to the top. Yeah. But I guess the, the point in all of that is that it's not as if that's the natural order of things, right? (laughs) Yeah. Um, it could be different, but it's not history is sort of unfolded in a in a particular way sure. and it's no accident that the melody and top line lyric are you know being so heavily valued in that time because copyright law was written you know based on the influence of <laughs> yeah. a european concert classical tradition You're right, right. Yeah. at at a moment in history when rhythms and percussion and drums were being derided and uh you know and that was you know, a, a product of, you know, race relations in the 19th century of European colonial power. And, wow, yeah. you know, that's, that, that's where those laws get put into place, right, in the early 20th century. So huh. it makes sense that drummers are being marginalized, but it's not as if they deserve to be. You know, there's a... <laughs> no, you're um, right. Yeah, so, so we really need to question, like, why that's the case, Right. Drummers are kind of put in a funny situation. Yeah. It's like, oh, I just said, uh, you can't copyright a drum beat. And it's like, well, why? <laughs> You're yeah. absolutely right. That it's cr- true. Yeah. That you can't, Yeah, but there, there are, there's a particular set of, you know, historical and sociological reasons for why that's the case. And it's not as if like, you know, in the 10 commandments or something, <laughs> you know, God said, <laughs> and by the way, you can't copyright drum beats, yeah. right? Thou shall uh, not copyright drum beats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there are particular reasons for that being the case. And wow. yeah, we need to sort of interrogate them. And one way of doing that is through, you know, historical work. Jeez. Okay. Well, you got me thinking now. You, <laughs> I mean, but the drums are such a it's different than having a, you know, a piano where there's like if you could copyright a drum beat and then let's say you couldn't play a beat like a regular 2/4 money beat because let's just say Ringo did it. No, I don't know who the first one to do it was, but let's say Ringo did it. Wouldn't that, that would really change the face of music because it's like, all right, well, we're yeah. out of, we're out of beats now. We're out of music. History would never have unfolded in the way that it did. And you know, it's, it's, you know, there are in terms of musical creativity, certain b- building blocks, which, you know, there is a, there's a good reason for them to uh, yeah. not be, enforced by copyright law. You could say the same with, you know, certain chord progressions. So like, uh, you know, a, uh, a five, one cadence, right? Sure. Like moving from a dominant to the tonic chord. If you copyrighted that move, <laughs> you know, then yeah. again, you know, music history would not be able to unfold as it did. That has to be something that we can borrow and make freely available in order to, um, to make work. Interesting. But, but this does change over time. Um, so, I don't know, you know, we're sort of going in, in many different tangential directions. Sure, here. yeah, you can take us back on track here. <laughs> so, exactly. To get back to the 1960s, let's, let's take it back to Ringo and Charlie and how they're feeling being in these bands for which there are no precedent, really, in terms of commercial success, in terms of, um, you know, groups that are collectively putting out material that they have also written, uh, and then how that affects the dynamics of those bands as businesses, um, and also as artistic enterprises, right? So there's the issue of, of getting paid here and that all the publishing is going to, for instance, Lennon McCartney in the yeah. case of the Beatles or Richard Jagger on, in the case of the Stones, but also in terms of, of art, you know, there's, uh, a transitional phase in terms of 
how the drummer is being valued for their work. And this is really interesting in the case of Charlie Watts, actually, because Charlie's coming from a jazz background. So both Ringo and Charlie, so many times in their interviews, they play down their own importance in those bands. Yeah. Um, You can go to interview after interview um, where they're saying, you know, all, all I'm doing is just playing the drums, you know, the, you know, either Lennon, McCartney, or Jagger Richards, or whoever it happens to be, whichever band, are, you know, they're doing all the heavy lifting. Um, but in Watts, he also talks about basically how he sees his skills as a drummer relative to a completely different paradigm, which is the jazz paradigm, hmm. right? Yeah. And so, you know, he's saying, not only am I a drummer who's just there to serve the song, which he'll often say in an interview, and the song is something which he sees as being different from something that he's produced, even though, like, for many drummers, you know, that Charlie Watts beat is, you know, an integral part of the song. Yeah. wouldn't be the same without it, right? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, but Charlie's also saying, you know, I am nothing compared to actual drummers, you know, like his words, Max Roach, uh, <laughs> yeah. Joe Morello, you know, Tony Williams, all jazz drummers who who Watts repeatedly heaps praise on. Um, and so he, he's he's really doing himself a disservice. But like, if that were actually true, then you wouldn't have um, similarly virtuosic drummers in, in a pop sphere in, in later decades, like Jeff Percaro or, or Jim Keltner, saying, actually, no, not anybody can can do what Charlie Watts does, right? <laughs> you know, Jeff Picaro on, on record is saying, like, you know, if he sat down and played with the Stones, he'd be trying to play like Charlie Watts, right? Yeah. So how do you square that? You know, I think part of that is because Watts doesn't see himself fitting into the rock star paradigm, right? You know, he his background is in jazz, and he's sort of evaluating his own work within a band based on jazz criteria. But, you know, okay, maybe if you judge Watts and his recordings, you know, by by the criteria which he seems to judge himself, which is, you know, the kind of um, jazz model. So he's not a Max Roach. Um, he's not playing that sort of music. So actually the, those criteria are sort of inappropriate on Ex- which to exactly. evaluate It just him, doesn't make right? sense. It doesn't fit. Yeah, so his, his contribution to um to rock drumming culture is undeniably monumental right yeah uh and the same thing with ringo right they set templates which generations of drummers then go on to to imitate and you can say the same with you know these other founding figures in rock drumming culture i I guess you know two others to um that have to be mentioned are are keith moon and john bonham Mm -hmm. of course um Moon, what's interesting about all those figures is actually, you know, although we see them as um, being at the beginning of a history, all of them were listening to Gene Krupa. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, there's a wonderful moment uh, when Ginger Baker is recalling his career, another one of these, you know, handful of canonical rock drummers from the 1960s, um, when he talks about him and Moon... Um, deciding that they want to get a drum kit with a double bass drum set up. And you would think, ah, they, that's maybe them pushing into um, playing ever larger venues with their, their bands, you know, needing to fill up the stage and sort of having this innovation in terms of, you know, rock spectacle and arena rock. But actually, uh, according to Baker, this idea comes from them watching Duke Ellington in oh, London really? in the 1960s. Yeah, huh. for sure, man. Yeah. Um, so Ginger Baker uh, said that both he and Keith Moon were at a Duke Ellington concert with Sam Woodyard playing mm-hmm. a double drum kit. And and this would have been like 65 or 66. And immediately both of them are like, we got to go out and, <laughs> and get awesome. an extra bass drum. Yeah. Right. It, uh, it's interesting because like you see Louis Belson playing the double bass kit and all these, all this stuff. And it's, um, y- you wouldn't think of that influence translating over to like, Keith Moon and Ginger Baker, like you're saying, but it's 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 all from jazz. It's awesome. Yeah, a hundred percent. And the the same goes for that showmanship element. You yeah. know, the flashy virtuosity of Gene Krupa kind of had to be there before Keith Moon or John Bonham are doing their thing. And you know, both of them in interviews, you know, 
you know, credit Krupa as like a really key influence when they were growing up. Yeah. Of course, like who else would they be looking to, right? Definitely. Um, you know, Buddy Rich is another key figure in terms of showmanship and, and virtuosity, but you know, there weren't rock drummers doing that. So of course they're all looking back to to jazz players. But at the same time, um that the the work of of being a drummer behind the kit is well at the same time having debts to the past it is changing right yeah um so there i think you know by by the late 1960s and especially when you start moving into into hard rock you know the the role of of a rock drummer really starts to take shape in a way which is quite different from what's come before um part of that comes with you know for instance power and aggression um, but then there are also other aspects to it, like virtuosity, which do harken back, you know, where there, there is a link to be made between, uh, between the jazz world and, uh, and rock, but not every drummer is, you know, needs to embody virtuosity in order to be a great rock drummer. Some do, um, particularly in, you know, as we start moving towards progressive rock and you have your, your Bill Brufords and your Carl Palmers and the rest, um, while others are, you know, valued for their, they're sort of primal or animalistic uh, showmanship. You know, Keith Keith Moon comes to mind. He's he's sort of one off. On the one hand, you could call his work virtuosic, but on on the other hand, you know, well, it's interesting. He 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 never claimed to um, to want to be a sort of master technician. Uh, he he always talked about how he would look towards guitar players actually, and he'd want to play guitar riffs on on the drum kit, oh, that's and that's cool. what he saw himself doing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you don't hear that so much uh, when you're looking at interviews with, say, jazz drummers from the 1950s. It's a, it's a different way of thinking about what it means to be playing that instrument. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting, too, how you say, um, like, looking at this, how you have Charlie Watts and Ringo, and they're kind of the the early post-jazz rock guys who are paving their way. Their drum sets looked very much like jazz drum sets, small four-piece a ride, a crash, hi hats. Um, but then you get into the the next phase. Let's say Keith Moon with the double bass, and um, mm-hmm. and I always think of like like uh, Rufus Jones, who was with Count Basie. He was double bass. You get these guys, so they're still pulling that. Oh, I didn't like. I can do that. I can get a double bass kit. But then the guys after that, the mega drummers, the big drum <laughs> sets, are yeah. are then building off of the Keith Moon set and stuff. So it seems like. Like you said, things are getting more aggressive and bigger. So you get into the '70s, more you know, giant drum sets. That's, yeah, absolutely. There's y- definitely an exhibitionist element to yeah. uh, to the drummers of the 1970s. Yeah, and that's also because um, the size of venues that these drummers were playing increases dramatically over that time. So you know, um, it was very rare for jazz gigs to you know take place in venues the size of arenas, <laughs> let alone stadiums. Sure. Right? But that becomes the norm for the biggest rock bands of the 1970s. And so suddenly, you know, you're having to reach people that are, you know, 10, maybe 20,000 seats back, right? Yeah, really. Uh, how, how do you connect with those people? Well, spectacle and size of, you know, things like the drum kit, you know, there's, it doesn't work for guitarists, right? You can't suddenly like, you know, say, okay, you have your double neck guitars, but you can't you know, quadruple the size of a guitar and, you know, the fretboard on it, for instance. Unless you're it wouldn't in be Cheap playable. Trick. If you're in Cheap Trick, well, you can have like a 15-neck <laughs> guitar. This is true, but it becomes impractical, you, let's face it. You're right, though. And, and a, a funny, a, a cool note on that is how everyone else is getting bigger, but Charlie and Ringo remained the same with their drum sets. Like, you could be in the biggest arena in the world, and you've got Charlie there playing his Gretsch kit with, you know... UFIP symbols and he's playing a small drum set. So um, I think that goes to show those guys how they're just like, we're going to do what we're going to do. But but you're absolutely right because there's there's obviously you got the guys who are playing. You just they're surrounded. And I do think 50, 60 percent of that is it's just a spectacle, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's also, you know, a, a form of competition and one that's one upsmanship as well, yeah. doing something which hasn't been done before, d- trying to outdo, you know, um, the the show or spectacle of of other competing bands and concerts, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, we're, we're we're talking about 
rock music quite a lot. And, you know, there are, there are other styles of music where you think about the, that, that maybe have interesting um, insights into, into what being a professional drummer was like in those days. And, and, and Clyde Stubblefield and the drummers of James Brown, Jabo Starks yeah. come to mind as a, as a different sort of model, it, you know, especially when we start going back to that discussion that we were having about um, where the drummer, you know, has their place creatively in terms of songwriting, in terms of authorship. Um, one thing that was really interesting when I was researching James Brown uh, and and his drummers was that I hadn't realized that it would, you know, by the mid 1960s, he typically employed between three and five drummers at any one time. And uh, according to uh, interviews with some of those drummers, the reason why is that Brown was interested in looking for unique beats and and unique performance styles. So he could tell, on the one hand, that there was something kind of close to the originality that we might attribute in the 1960s to a really unique melody or lyric. Yeah. That, the, that, that, that that was also a feature of drum beats as well. And this comes back to like, you know, well, why can't you copyright, you know, for instance, the drum bake from from Funky Drummer, which Clyde Stubblefield, you know, you could make an easy argument that that's like a composition in its own right. Yeah, you know? definitely. And yet the credit of, you know, of any James Brown hit goes 100% to, to James Brown, you know, very occasionally to one of his horn players, but never to the drummer, no. quite crucially. No. It's interesting, you know, you have these different models of, you know, drummers either, you know, receiving a, a certain kind of credit, you know, either for being, you know, uh, an unprecedentedly like powerful drummer or virtuosic drummer or exhibitionist drummer, but rarely do drummers get that recognition for contributions to to the song, to to composition, to creating the artistic aesthetic of of those bands. At least in that time, you know, things have changed a lot, and we now sort of see the work of those drummers in a completely different light. Um, you know, in the in the twenty first century, yeah, they they now get, I think you know, the, the tables have turned and, and they're getting the rec- recognition, which was kind of denied to them for so long. But certainly, in, you know, in the 1970s, it's interesting, you think on on the one hand, like, to have been Keith Moon or to have been John Bonham, you must have been on top of the world, right? You were acknowledged as these incredible musicians playing in these incredible pioneering bands. But, you know, when you read interviews with, with those drummers, you know, they one of the reasons why they had huge amounts of trouble with, you know, substance abuse. Yes. It was due to low self-esteem, self-destructive tendencies, you know, at, at, at being kind of relegated to this sort of, uh, you know, low status figure in these extremely famous bands, right? Well, and uh, uh, you just, re- you read my mind. Like, this seems like the era of, and those two guys, Keith Moon and John Bonham, which both had, they died way too young. You are a rock star. I mean, I don't know if there's, I feel like they are like the, the, um, the blueprint of what people think of when they think of a rock star with a capital R it's like, yeah, these guys are and and, and it's not good, but like taking horse tranquilizers or whatever and passing out on your drums. It's like, um, so they, they went big and, and maybe that's because they're then on posters and kids rooms and they are seen more as these giant rock stars, uh, but you're like, so it's interesting what you're saying about low self-esteem of I'm not Jimmy Page. I'm not the guy writing this. I'm not Robert Plant, which is yeah. just such a and shame. That's, that's, and that's not me theorizing it. You know, that's them yeah. on record in interview, you know, and in memoirs and biographies that have been written about them. You know, that, that really comes through and it's, yeah, it's, it's incredibly tragic, you know, um, but they are sort of forced to live up to these particular stereotypes which were being you know formed around them uh and part of that is in a way like not taking the work that they did seriously yeah. right as opposed to the work that their bandmates did yeah yeah so to think too that they were both 32 years old when they died is unbelievable to think about yeah. being so young i mean you're 32 years old you're you're still i mean you are barely an adult at that point really it's just like to have lived and made such a giant contribution to the world of drumming and just disappeared so quickly is uh is such a shame 
Yeah, I mean, and and clearly the their deaths were the result of of complicated circumstances. Yes, you know, this you can't attribute it to to one single factor, but it's also it's undeniable that you know that self destructive substance abuse was was in both cases fueled at least in part by by feelings of inadequacy that were stemming from a belief that their bandmates were were seen as the real artists while they were just the drummers in that band and and had to fulfill a certain a certain role within that. Yeah. Which was sort of impossible to live up to. Yeah. Now, um, to get it kind of back to the working drummers, uh, you know, theme that we have going on mm-hmm. here, is there any comment or any, or is there any information about how um, they would have been paid less? They would have been seen, you know, like Robert Plant is probably making more money than John Bonham, even though, you know, you see the song remains the same and he's racing cars and doing, you know, he has a nice big house and stuff, but um, and that may be, he may be an extreme example cause he's John Bonham, but, um, were they still yeah. like drummers in general at that point? I'm sure they were still probably paid less and didn't get writing credits as you're saying, but, but financially probably not covered as much as, you know, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, right? Yeah. Well, I think that the, the key thing is that they're, they're separate revenue, revenue streams, you know, uh, publishing rights versus band profits. So there wasn't a sort of set model for uh any of these bands you you know um the band's management in in any of these cases would set up legal agreements between the the different members of the band you look at the different revenue streams say from live performance on the one hand mm-hmm. record sales on the other um merchandise or songwriting and then divvy those profits up accordingly yeah. but you know and it's a it's difficult to make generalizations about like, you know, how, how drummers fared, you know, across the board, because those agreements were, uh, there wasn't a standard set of agreements, I guess, in terms of how to, how to share profits. So, um, you know, famously in, um, in some bands from the 1980s onwards, like U2 and, uh, U2 and REM, uh, band profits were, were divided equally, but, what I'm what I'm trying to um, make an argument about, I guess, in terms of songwriting, is that that sort of agreement had to be made uh, deliberately to counter a built-in inequality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's ingrained in how songwriting credit and and, and copyright traditionally worked. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any drummers who are in bands that are listening to this will have encountered a similar situation to um, to myself, but I know when I was playing in a band and we were first registering our songs uh, with, you know, the British equivalent of, of ASCAP and BMI and, you know, d- dividing up, you know, which songwriting credits went where. And we, we asked for advice on this. And the advice that we were given by a professional working for one of these royalty collection agencies was, you know, whoever writes the melody in the top line lyric is the songwriter, right? Yeah. Um, and many lawsuits famously uh you know deal with the the drummer being uh basically getting the short end of the stick on these types of agreements um so if you move on into for instance the the 1980s there's a very famous and well documented case um between Mike Joyce the drummer for the Smiths and uh and Morrissey and Marr where he sues them for um for profits that the that the band was making and at the time uh, the the profit split between the four members of the Smiths were forty percent for Morrissey, forty percent for Johnny Marr, ten percent for uh, Rourke on bass, and ten percent for for Joyce on drums. Hmm. You know that's not a profit split that we can say like all bands operated like that, but it wouldn't have been unusual. Yeah, sure, right. And so the Joyce then has to come back at the end of the nineteen eighties, and this is completely diff- different from. Um, from songwriting splits, right? Yeah. He wasn't claiming a lawsuit against songwriting uh, credits. He was he was talking about profit splits of the band, um, and so he he takes uh, Morrissey and Mar to court, and and Morrissey famously shows up in in court uh, testifying that in terms of the Smiths' output, um, Joyce and Rourke on uh, drums and bass were just session musicians. Uh, it, it, the famous quote was that was that they were as replaceable as the parts of a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, come um, on, that's not but nice. This, 
But despite that testimony, uh, the judge ruled in favor of Joyce, Good. right? Um, yeah, recognizing that that was like an inaccurate account by Morrissey. Morrissey, who he, he also described as being, uh, and I think this is a, a, a quote, uh, truculent and unreliable. Uh, so, <laughs> so you know, I, I think that that case is illustrative of how it worked for a lot of drummers playing in bands in the 1970s and, and 1980s. Um, there, there were basically mechanisms in the system of remunerating musicians for their work that, uh, that went against the, the favor of drummers mm. in a lot of cases. Gosh. Well, well, I think, um, and we'll move forward here cause we have, we have still, you know, 50 years to go or 40 years to go, but, um, <laughs> I think it's worth noting too that, and, and I've talked about it a lot. We've talked about it a lot in different episodes, but about how Ringo and let's say Charlie, but really Ringo made drumming extremely popular with young kids. And then that made Ludwig blow up. And I think the same can be said about John Bonham. These, the guys were then as far as gear goes, were becoming superstars in the world of drummers as, you know, like premier, you think of Keith Moon. So yeah, they drove the growth of the drum kit manufacturing industry. Yes. And the made in Japan market basically started because they said, oh my God, we need to create these, these off brand Ludwigs and, and, uh, expand on that. So global expansion with drummers, thanks to, um, Ringo. And everyone else, Charlie, Keith, everyone. Yeah, a hundred percent. There's definitely accounts um, from Ludwig, but also interesting, like you know, manufacturing companies that that Ringo uh, never went close to, like Gretsch, saying that basically after 1964 and that appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show, they had to double production or triple production, or yeah. you know, keep their factories open 24 hours a night to to meet demand. Yeah. And with all of that demand and companies not being able to expand quickly enough, it, it did open this gap in the market for new companies and coming from Japan in particular, like Pearl, like Tama, like Yamaha, exactly. um, by the end of the 1960s to, to start creating drums to, to meet that growing demand. Um, and interestingly, like, you know, creating their own innovations in the process, right? Yeah. Um, when we think about uh, those classic Yamaha recording custom kits with this, you know, beautiful black lacquer finish, right? Yeah. And, you know, th that absolutely stems from Yamaha having their, their previous history in making upright pianos, right? Ah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so they have all these, you know, interesting, um, innovative manufacturing techniques that were maybe being used, uh, you know, for, for other instruments that then start getting applied to, to drums. And in the case of, you know, hardware, even though, say, John Bonham, for instance, never played Tama drums, you know, his impact, uh, both literal and metaphorical on, <laughs> on drumming as performance and the, you know, um, the, the heaviness of, of rock drumming that kind of developed from the beginning of the 1970s onwards, you know, leads manufacturers like Tama to invent double bracing for mm. their stands, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, when you look at the stands that <laughs> John Bonham was playing at the end of the 1960s, like it's amazing that they withstood, you know, a, <laughs> yeah. a single hit, you know, they're yeah. puny little things. Yes. Um, but you know, the, the shape of the drum kit, you know, you, you could say the shape and design of the drum kit is driven by the popularity of these rock drummers coming out of the 1960s leads to, you know, new manufacturers coming up who are then trying to like, um, you know, create a USP for themselves through design innovation. And that really dramatically affects, you know, the de development and the de design of the drum kit as, as an instrument. Mm. Um, but it's, it's interesting with thinking like one sphere of work, you know, playing the drums, you know, having this really tangible impact and relationship on another sphere of industry was like, you know, manufacturing and selling drums as instruments. They're all related. Mm. Yeah. Which, I mean, again, I was born in 1990 and it, John Bonham heavily influenced me as a kid. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, sure. And, and I guess, I mean, he died 10 years earlier than that, which isn't that far, but like it, his, his impact is still huge today. So, um, yeah, on gear and everything, but, uh, okay. Absolutely. So last time we ran out of time and we had to do a part two. So to avoid a part three, let's, uh, sure. <laughs> let's move forward here. So we're in the seventies. 
let's finish up the seventies, get into the eighties and then, uh, and then push on through. So where do we go from there? Um, well, I think that one really important thing that happens, uh, to the drummer from the 1970s onwards, uh, we can say is how their work changes in the recording studio. Hmm. And that really, uh, is an effective, the invention of multi-tracking, yeah. which of course is a 1950s invention, but you know, really only starts to take shape with from eight track recordings onwards, you know, in the, in the latter half of the 1960s. Um, and suddenly, you know, whereas you only previously had a mono channel, then a stereo channel, then, then four tracks, the drum kit as an instrument is always going to be pushed to the bottom of, of the mix essentially in those songs, uh, with eight channels and then 24 and then suddenly 48, you have suddenly a channel for each component of that drum kit, which allows engineers and producers to really start pushing the, the sound of, of that drum kit up and up. Yeah. Um, and and do interesting things besides, like not just affecting the drum kit, but overall basically trying to like increase the impact of, you know, the kick, the snare, toms and cymbals. And so I think like in terms of the development of the drum kit and 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 working behind the kit, uh, you know, a, a key characteristic of, of the 1970s and 1980s is this interesting tension between engineers and producers on the one hand and drummers on the other. Like who has the authority over <laughs> the performance of the drums and the sound of the drum kit? Wow. Um, because you know, a, a classic example of that maybe being like um, the debut album of, of Joy Division in 1979, "Unknown Pleasures," where uh, the poor drummer um, Stephen Morris he you know is just having an incredibly hard time with the producer Martin Hannett, uh, you know, who's getting him to record you know each individual element of the of the kit like so you know do a take yeah. where he's playing only the hi hat or only the rack tom right yeah um which allows the producer to really manipulate those things and create an incredible record on the one hand but that's like hell on earth for oh, a drummer yeah. right which still happens today i mean that happens a lot where you do a cymbals pass and a you know just drums yeah pass. exactly yeah yeah so that didn't exist right in the 60s no no <laughs> but it becomes increasingly common uh maybe from the tail end of the 70s and onwards into the 80s and so on the one hand, that's an interesting impact aesthetically, but it also, you know, has a real impact in terms of like what the work of the drummer is, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, throughout the 1980s, you know, the drummer has, again, this huge importance in the studio. They're the, they're the first instrument to be tracked uh, often. They're the most complicated instrument to be tracked. Yeah. But at the same time, the drummer has very little autonomy quite often and is being like told what to do or directed or or marginalized in other ways by their bandmates and by the producers because you can't, you know, move forward without getting that really solid drum take. Yeah. Um, and so they're they're often very restricted. The same thing goes for a click track, you know, very typical, you know, click track sort of um become increasingly popular through the, you know, uh, second half of the 70s and then kind of ubiquitous by the 1980s, especially once you have like MIDI, which is invented at the early 1980s and suddenly you need to like start mapping takes of drums onto, you know, sequencers and synthesizers that are programmed to do arpeggios or whatever it happens to be. Um, so before you know, then, there the, was, they would not play to a click track, which for everyone who's listening, if you don't know, a click track is a metronome which can be referred to as playing like on the grid. And the importance of that would be to then overdub later or to mix with MIDI instruments, which are perfectly in time because they're a machine. Um, if you record something without a metronome, it can have a really good feel and kind of sway, but you can't exactly overdub a drum part again and fix things over a guitar track that's been recorded without a metronome unless you're perfect um which is yeah. rare so <laughs> anyway so so before you said 1960s the 1960s well, it wasn't really a, there what they didn't record to a metronome i mean you certainly you had metronomes they're they're a early oh, 19th yeah. century sure, invention sure um and you had people recording to something close to a click track um but it was usually relegated to the world of film music mm. where people had to sync up um soundtracks to a moving picture yeah right uh it wasn't something that was used in pop groups um until 
you know, became became more common in the 1970s, and also with the advent of drum machines, yeah, um, <clears throat> which really only start getting used in records by the tail end of the 1960s. Probably the, so it's the kind Lynn of a, drum machine or something like that. The Lynn drum machine uh, comes in 1979, actually. Okay. So I'm actually thinking in of earlier drum machines being like um, the Rhythm Ace oh, in, cool. or the the Maestro Rhythm King, which you can hear <laughs> on tracks like. Um, like Sly and the Family Stone used some of these drum machines in the early 1970s. Again, not very common, although you do find these you know, transistor drum machines being used by, you know, in the demo process and then kind of being laid down as a bed track in the 1970s, which then a drummer might um, start to to play over top of. So, yeah. you know, that's that starts to happen through, through the 70s, but then becomes increasingly common uh, through the 1980s. And of course, like, who gets lumped with the headphones that have the click track really banging in their ears, but the drummer, yeah. you know, often the other musicians, you know, don't get that click track in their ears, right? You yeah. know, they get the drums. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so there's a real form of kind of subordination, depending on how you feel about click tracks, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, a burden that the drummer has to bear. Yeah. Um, which really, really affects their autonomy as a, as a worker and as a musician, um, you know, through the night, well, so let's say the end of the 1970s, and then very much so in the 1980s and 1990s, where it only almost becomes like impossible to do a professional studio recording without that click track. Yeah, yeah, really cool. That's interesting. And I mean, I'd say that like working at a studio, I rarely ever, unless it's jazz, do a session where I record a drummer without a click track. And if they don't want it, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm a drummer. I, I know that it's not as fun. I know that it's hard, especially if you haven't practiced, man, there is, you've never seen, and I've been there early on, but you, you, it's, you don't see someone get as embarrassed as if they've, they're playing and they cannot play to the click. It is Mm, a very embarrassing situation if you haven't ever practiced it and there's a room full of people and they're like, um, you're speeding up on the fill. So that's a tough situation. That's a big, that's a big thing to throw on a drummer. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you though, I read this really interesting round table between like the very top session drummers of the 1980s. So Jeff Beccaro, Vinny Colaiuta, uh, Rick Morata, and some others. Um, and this is when like click tracks were really becoming, you know, more commonplace. And they were complaining about these things and they were saying, you know, like we have these clicks in our ears. Like think about these drummers and their sense of time, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, really. We've got these clicks in our ears, you know, and and we want to play a song where, where the tempo breathes a little bit, you know, where say there's a course, you know, you, you maybe do want to lift that up by a few BPM or sure. not, but like we're getting lumped with these click tracks and then, and then guitarists are, you know, yelling at us saying that, you know, that, that we're not sort of moving with the song or not serving the song when, <laughs> when actually we're being restricted here. This is like Jeff Percaro saying this, right? Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, the king there. I mean, and nowadays you can yeah. tempo map and make it a little faster, but it's still, it's just yeah. like a, and they'll say like, and then you get the classic thing of the drummer saying like, man, the click is off. Like the the click's not off, dude. Don't. (laughs) It's perfect. I'll I'll tell you one other thing that uh, made an impact on drummers here, and this is uh, you know very related to click tracks. And in a way, uh, this uh, we have one of our own to blame for this. Um, The digital audio workstation obviously is another key change. Um, Yeah. You know, basically in the 1980s, you're still recording mostly to analog desks. But by the 1990s, Pro Tools becomes the industry standard. Sure. Not many people know that the invention of Pro Tools um, can actually be pinned down to to a drummer and his bandmate, actually. Really? Um, Peter Gotcher and Evan Brooks were the designers of, or the inventors of Pro Tools. Uh, and they were students in California who played in a band together. Peter Gotcher was a drummer. Uh, and he was interested in these new um, drum sample uh, drum samplers. Essentially, there was one called Drumulator <laughs> in the mm-hmm. early 1980s, where it came with this pre-equipped set of drum sounds, and he wanted to expand that. So he and his bandmate Evan Brooks, who was an engineer, uh, decided to hack into this Drumulator and make new sound chips where they could upload their own samples. And then also attach an audio editor to that so that they could uh, edit the audio um, of, of these different drum tracks and, and kind of expand the creativity, uh, the creative possibilities for the drummer while using these new technologies. 
And the company that they created is called Digidrum. Hmm. By the end of the 1980s, uh, they had switched the name of that company to Digidesign. Yeah. And they were trying to figure out how to edit audio um, in, using some sort of visual display. And the result was Pro Tools. Man, that's awesome. Digidesign, they owned Pro Tools forever until Avid bought them, which um, yeah. wasn't that long ago. So, man, that's really interesting. You could say, like, you know, basically some of the biggest developments in terms of the recording studio uh, from the 1980s to the present day come from attempts to shape what the drummer is doing or shape the sounds of the drum kit. Hmm. Uh, and then other instruments sort of follow suit when these new technologies come into play. Wow. You could say that, and I do say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So um, click track, we got that going. We're in the studio. Session drumming is different. Um, electronic drums, are sa- samplers and synthesizers and all this stuff is, ha- is happening. So um, yeah, we're- Yeah, and we're- I guess the the other thing to say about this is that you know, we've been talking about the studio quite a bit, but this also has ripple effects into the live arena, right? Yeah. Um, so as soon as these new sounds start being created in the recording studio, drummers are suddenly expected to replicate them live, right? <laughs> and so sure. when you have things like that famous Phil Collins gated reverb yep. uh, that um, is created at the in the very early 1980s with uh, Hugh Padham, who was the engineer working on those records, uh, suddenly... You know, when it comes to performing those in in arena tours, the drummer is suddenly playing to a click track, you know, in a, in a live concert setting, and their drums are going through effects racks that are trying to recreate that gated reverb sound, yeah, right? Yeah. So, like, you know, the work that happens in the studio has an impact on the on the rest of um, a working drummer's life. You know, whether it's in the studio or outside of the studio. Yeah, absolutely. And just so everyone is on the same page. The gated reverb sound is basically, so you have the reverb sound, which would be a ch- like a tail of, you know, putting it in a room, like a bah. Then you gate it and cut it off. And that's very much that sound of uh, like in the air tonight or, or any of those big bah, like huge tom yeah. sounds. So gated reverb. Or most of the big pop hits of the 1980s. Exactly. Yeah. In the air tonight is sort of the, the classic example, but yes. you hear that drum sound, you know, being in a way like the the easiest way to be able to place uh, a pop recording as saying oh yeah that's definitely recorded in the 1980s is that drum sound yeah and and I think it's worth noting that like that's the era of like power toms and super deep huge snare drums so everything was much bigger the the opposite of 40 years earlier where it's kind of the <clears throat> bebop high tuning jazz sound now we are big and deep and uh and so so a far cry from from the you know the jazz days but um cool so we're in the 80s which is just an iconic era of of drums um in general i i have a uh or i had i should say a late 80s early 90s set that i think i talked about in the last one um where it was just the hardware it was a ludwig rocker set the hardware was not good i don't know i think this was an era where where things were Still getting developed a little bit, like like every like you said, where John Bonham's playing these tiny stands. But I know when I play that set, you play for five minutes and the tom is like facing the ground and has completely lost its tension. So, right. <laughs> um, so things are still getting figured out, basically. Yeah, and I guess the other key difference for for drummers as they move on into you know say the the nineteen eighties and the nineteen nineties is the in, you know the creation of organizations and societies that are dealt dedicated to kind of cohering um, drumming as a culture, you know, and, and drumming as, as a form of work as well. So, you know, we think of uh, a convention like PASIC, yeah. uh, the Percussive Arts Society International Convention, you know, as as maybe existing for who knows how long. Well, you know, this is a mid-1970s creation. Like the Percussive Arts Society is formed in the 1960s. The convention only gets going in uh, the second half of the 1970s. And then, you know, drum publications, which, you know, are another key sign of of drumming being kind of taken seriously as its own specialized form of work. Uh, magazines like Modern Drummer, its first issue was in 1977. So, like, you know, these, these types of magazines, conferences, meetups that really sort of glue together um, drumming as a profession, drumming as a culture, drumming as a, a community, you know, these are 
in the long view, in terms of the history of the instrument, relatively recent developments. But you know, their impact is huge as well, right? Absolutely. On the culture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great point because I mean, I guess before that, you're kind of just playing off by yourself. But then you can, like I said earlier, about you can you can build off of other people, and 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 that just goes to to show our community. And I, obviously, there's guitar magazines and stuff, but um, drums have a special connection there. So, um, so. Things change in the '90s, though, a little bit, right? I mean, it's not—it's—it's it's the end of that glam rock era for the working drummer. So your 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 drum set seems like it's maybe getting a little bit smaller, right? Yeah, sure. And and you could say actually, like maybe the '90s is the beginning of of where retro fetishism <laughs> starts to come into play. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. Yeah. So you know, nowadays it's not unusual for us to uh, see drum manufacturers you know, recreating the classic drum kits of yesteryear, you know, where vintage and artisan are the, you know, kind of key marketing uh, points that, uh, that, that current manufacturers are sort of looking, looking back to the golden age of drumming, you know, maybe th- that the first hint of that starts to uh, become apparent in the 1990s when drummers start scaling back that, you know, giant kit moving back to the four piece kit, back to basics, um, which of course is like harkening back to, you know, the sort of post-war era from uh, from beboppers up to the classic, you know, Ringo Starr, Black Oyster Pearl Ludwig kit. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. The gear gear wise to think about that because uh, before that, guys are playing the massive set of pearls and the set of Thomas where there there's fifteen, you know, bass drums hanging behind them that they play. They hit once in a concert or something like that. Um, and music is obviously becoming a little more, I think, I think there in the nineties, it gets to be a little more, uh, let's say natural. You know what I mean? It's less of the reverb, gated reverbs and all that. That gated reverb effect goes out of style. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, so now we go up to the, what you call the globalization of the drum kit production. Um, that is basically, uh, an argument I was trying to make and, and I'm not the, the first to make it either. I'm, absolutely indebted to, you know, previous books that have come out on the drum kit by folk like Jeff Nichols, Rob Cook, uh, you know, many others, but saying that um, essentially we're, whereas previously um, Amer- American manufacturers like Ludwig, Slingerland, Gretsch, Rogers really led the way, um, suddenly by the end of the 1960s, you have manufacturers from outside of the U.S., that begin to have an international impact. Now, drum kits were were being made in uh, countries outside of the U.S. You know, long before that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Sonar is one of the oldest drum com- drum companies in in the world. Yeah. Uh, if you take that back to before they were called so- Sonar, but you know, the same sort of family company was uh, founded by a guy named Johannes Link in 1871. So, like, wow, you know, yeah, ages ago. Um, but sonar begins to have a more international impact in the second half of the 1960s um, as as an impo- as it uh, sort of resuscitates itself in the post-war era being a German manufacturer for obvious reasons mm-hmm. that you know that company has to kind of um, you know it collapses reforms and rethinks itself in the post-war era yeah. Um, yeah. but then also those those uh, uh, East Asian companies that I was mentioning so Pearl Tamaha uh, Tama, Tamaha, uh, <laughs> Pearl Tama and Yamaha, um, you know, get into the drum making business at the end of the 1960s. So when I, when I talk about the globalization of, of drum kit manufacture, it's really about, um, companies coming from outside of the United States, but beginning to have an influence on the Anglo-American popular music scene, uh, and drummers being, you know, starting to uh, use those kits. So whether it's Billy Cobham using Tama or Mm -hmm. Steve Gadd using Yamaha, um, these become, you know, really important uh, and influential manufacturers um, from, from the 1970s onwards, basically. Whereas now they're they're seen, you know, essentially as, um, you know, equals in every conceivable way to, um, to those older American manufacturers. Cool. Well, we're getting close to the end of the chapter here. So, um, and and I just again I want to tell people that we were talking about chapter five of Matt's almost four hundred page uh, amazing book all about the drum kit. So um, if you are like me and like Matt and are a giant drum nerd, then um, you are going to love this book because it goes into so much more 
detail than than we're going into and i think we're going into a lot of a lot of detail so um yeah um i would highly recommend people and i'm going to put a promo code in the uh description so you can get um i believe it's 30 percent off the book um yeah that's right if people go to the website uh oup.com slash academic uh because the publisher of the book is oxford university press so the website um is oup.com slash academic. And then if you type in my name, Matt Brennan, or the title of the book, Kick It, A Social History of the Drum Kit, uh, and order a copy, then you can enter a promo code, uh, which is all caps, A-A-F-L-Y-G-6. Then that will automatically take 30% uh, off the regular price uh, when ordering from that website. It's also available you know, via Amazon or, you know, any online bookstore that you would want to order it from. Um, but the the cheapest way to get it is um, through the OUP website and using that discount code. Yeah. And I mean, I think the uh, the it's like twenty nine dollars. You can obviously get a hard copy version, but um, the paperback, I think it's only like twenty nine dollars US. So um, that's right. Throw 30 percent on there. And um I have heard, I, I have a copy that I love, and I've heard from uh, multiple listeners of the show that they've ordered it and are loving it. So um, Amazing. Yeah, I really appreciate all you guys and girls out there listening um, for ordering it and supporting people like Matt, who's who's doing this, and uh, just find Matt online and reach out to him and, uh, and, and tell him you like his book and all that good stuff. So, well, Matt, I think we did it, my friend. I think we've just uh, wrapped up part two of our two-part uh, look at the history of working drummers. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show, Bart. I really appreciate it, and I, I love what you're doing here with the podcast. Great, thank you. It's always a pleasure, and uh, enjoy enjoy the rest of your day there in Scotland. All right, you too, man. Take care. All right, bye-bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.